Greetings, everyone, and welcome to LRVS Americas 2023. I'm Douglas Purnell, and I'll be your moderator for this section. Let's welcome our next speaker, Andre Michel Ferrari, owner of Cogito Reliability Inc., as he shares his expert advice on the bathtub, Curb Explained. Good day, reliability and maintenance fellow professionals. My name is Andre Michel Ferrari. I am a reliability engineer and owner of Cogito Reliability. Today, I'm going to make you discover or maybe rediscover the bathtub curve, which is a con common concept in reliability engineering. First of all, I'd like to thank the LRVS 2023 organizing committee for inviting me again this year, and specifically Sanya Mathura, who not only is a great organizer, but also an outstanding colleague in the world of maintenance and reliability engineering, women in STEM, and many other great initiatives that bring this community together. So jumping in as part of the presentation of objectives, we will introduce reliability engineering concepts, and then we will use those concepts to understand wh where and how a bathtub curve comes from. The reason I am introducing reliability engineering principles is because when I perform a reliability study on an asset, uh, there's a vast amount of information that comes out of the study which can satisfy many different needs in an organization from supply chain, that is spare parts, to maintenance strategies via designs and budgeting. We will then understand how the bathtub curve is built and finally see examples of what information it provides us. When we do a reliability study on an asset, we typically use life cycle records such as failures or specific performance parameters of interest to us. In this process example here, I have a set of N new light bulbs on a test bench. I switch all the light bulbs on simultaneously at time zero and record the time to the failure of each of the light bulbs. We can see that the individual units fail at different intervals. Some fail early, some later, and some not at all uh, when the test is finished. In essence, all the different failure intervals will provide us with what we call the life characteristics of the population of, a light, of light bulbs and uh, how a typical light bulb is expected to behave over its life cycle. The next step is to define a statistical distribution or model that will best represent the life cycle of this asset we are stu studying. Typical distribution will be Weibull, log normal, exponential, Gaussian, etc. We have the best statistical once we have the best statistical distribution or the best life model, we have to make the model work for us. So we do some mathematical transformation to this model and we end up with what I quoted earlier, the variety of information that can be used to inform different individuals in an organization so that they can make the best decisions on how to manage the asset over the lifetime of the same asset. We are trying to predict how a typical light bulb is going to survive in the future. So for example, in this case, the last graph shows the probability of failure uh, uh, after a certain time interval. So probability of failure of a light bulb after a certain time interval in operation. So in this case, reading off the graph, we have 70% chance of having a failure after 900 days of operation of a light bulb. Likewise, further calculations will show we expect two failures, two light bulb failures over a 1500-day interval, which means I have to have two uh, spare light bulbs in stock over this 1500-day interval to replace those failed light bulbs. So many more inf 
much more information available from the reliability study would require an additional presentation for that but you're welcome to uh, contact me and ask me more questions about those outputs so moving on as mentioned earlier a reliability study can provide various types of information to an operator in this slide, we show two outputs, one on the left, which is a probability of failure graph mentioned earlier, and the one on the right is called a failure rate graph. The probability of failure uh, graph, probability of failure graph on the left can be used for risk calculation. Typically, risk is a product of probability of failure and consequence as shown in the equation below. So if we have the probability of failure here and we know the consequence, we can estimate the risk uh, in terms of uh, the future performance of the asset. The other graph on the right is much more of interest to us in this presentation. It is what we call a failure rate curve, and it represents the speed, the celerity of failure over time. We have the speed of failure on the vertical asset axis and the asset lifetime from time zero on the horizontal axis. The failure rate is expressed in failures per unit of time. So failures per year, failures per uh, month, etc. Typically, failure rate curves increase over the lifetime of the asset. For example, if you own a vehicle, the frequency of failures will increase over time as the vehicle ages. Failures will occur more and more frequently. So, if you have a failure rate curve for your car, it will show an increase over time, just like the, the curve on the right. However, it, this is not always the case. We, we don't have always have increasing failure rate curves, as we will see when we start talking about the bathtub curve in the next slide. We have previously defined the required reliability concept, so now let's move into building the bathtub curve. The theoretical bathtub curve is essentially a combination of three failure rate curves, as shown on the right here, the red, the blue, and the green. We have the uh, failure rate or the speed of failure over time on the vertical axis and the asset lifetime on the horizontal axis. So when the three curves are combined, uh, we would have a U or V-shaped figure in the form of a sanitary bathtub, and that's where the name comes from. A bit like, a, all this is a bit like a roller coaster ride, but isn't it uh, what operating a plant is like, ups and downs all the time? On a side note, those three curves are built based on a Weibull distribution and beta, the Greek letter B uh, is, uh, is the shape parameter of the Weibull distribution. We will not be elaborating further on this, but you're welcome uh, to contact me if you want uh, further explanation on Weibull statistical distributions. So why three? Why three failure rate curves or three statistical phenomena? This is because the typical life of an asset can see three stages, uh, which I will define. So at the start on the left, where beta is um, uh, less than one, uh, the, the, we have the stage called infant mortality, which represents a premature failure due to manufacturing defects or uh, inadequate maintenance practices. Maybe because we, we have lots of lubrication experts here, it could be due to over lubrication uh, or inadequate lub lubrication. Um, those failures are best addressed by 
uh, root cause analysis, doing an RCA, and identifying the root cause of the undesirable phenomena occurring here, uh, or the incorrect work practices, and then correcting them. Uh, just, uh, just to, there's a paradigm that uh, we buy new equipment and they, they, wouldn't, they should not fail at the start, but uh, the bathtub curve shows you that you can have early failures. So an example of infant mortality is you buy a shiny new car and drive, up, drive off the dealership parking lot only to find out that uh, this car has defects. So now you have to come back and get it repaired. So now moving on to the middle section. Uh, this is called the random failure or useful life section. Uh, the failure rate as uh, represented here is flat, it's constant, meaning that uh, the failure rate does not change over time. So failures occur at random and appear to be influenced by external factors rather than the degradation of the asset itself. From a maintenance standpoint, this ex uh, section is extremely difficult to manage. Preventive maintenance or proactive repairs are not effective. And uh, we need contingency plans like uh, readily available spare parts or a ready to go uh, repair plan uh, as, as a best strategy, right? As with infant mortality, this interval is, uh, is also uh, undesirable. So example of random failures, your shiny new uh, defective now fixed car is on the road for five years. It's battered by potholes, weather, or maybe poor driving habits and fails unexpectedly, even if you follow the correct maintenance practices. So moving on to the rightmost section, where beta is more than one. This is called the uh, aging or wear out section. The failure rate as represented here increases or, over time. And uh, it, this corresponds to the time in the life of an asset where age related failures appear to increase over time. So the use of the asset over time generates deterioration leading to in, an increase in repair frequency and subsequently an increase in the cost of maintenance. So this section offers a predictable failure pattern over time and can be managed by a variety of maintenance tasks. So in the ideal world, in the best of worlds, all assets should only have a wear out failure rate so that financial and other resources can be planned and allocated for the medium or long term, including uh, end of life replacement. So an example of wear out failures using your vehicle again, it's not so shiny anymore. It's been on the road for 10 years. Its components start wearing out one by one and you see more and more frequent failures. So um, the deterioration of component can also lead to secondary damage escalating the failure frequency. So in this case, you can estimate when the next failure is going to occur and also plan ahead for a new replacement car. Moving on. So the bathtub curve illustrated in the previous slide was perf perfectly symmetrical. Nice bathtub. In reality, this is not the case. This slide shows examples of uh, bathtub curves. So the first one here, um, the first bathtub curve here is uh, V-shaped. Um, uh, it has practical, it has an infant mortality section on the left, pretty steep and practically no random failures. And after the infant mortality section finishes, it moves immediately into the wear out section. The second one, as shown here is a little bit less straightforward and somewhat confusing. Uh, it's a W-shaped bathtub curve indicated that this hump in the middle, uh, uh, it, we have competing failure modes, but we can still see um, the infant mortality section on the left, pretty steep, 
and the final wear out element or section on the right. So this is just to show that bathtub curves are not symmetrical in reality and um, they can have various shapes and uh, we will now move on to see how we can extract information from so now let's jump into the analysis of an example of a bathtub curve. Typically use the software and enter my failure records and then I get uh, um, uh, this bathtub curve here, right? Remember a bathtub curve is made up of Weibull distributions and so the, um, the software I would use would uh, give me uh, the number of uh, sections that I have in my bathtub curve. In this case, I have three sections, population one, population two, and population three. And uh, the second rows give me the parameters that govern each of the three weighable distributions. So the beta shape parameter or the eta scale parameter. The software gives me all those parameters on the two rows. And at the bottom, it gives me the weight of each of the sections. So we have three sections. So first section with 16%, the next section 9%, and the last section 75%, right? So that's how I can see the influence of each section on uh, uh, how they in, uh, how they make up the bathtub curve. So um, if I uh, dig further, uh, I can see that for the first section, it's an infant mortality section. Uh, the beta value is 0 0.86, less than one, and it has a 16% uh, weighting. And we can see uh, in the in the curve uh, the decrease in failure rate on the left, which indicates infant mortality. Uh, the next two sections, population two and population three, are aging section because beta is more than one, and uh, they combined. Um, uh, influence or total weighting is 84%. So we can see that this bathtub curve is strongly influenced by uh, wear out failures and uh, infant mortality failures are in the minority if you want. But if an operator feels that 16% uh, infant mortality is still too much, it's unacceptable, or it presents a, for example, a safety hazard to the operation or to the people working in the operation, then he might want to do an RCA and identify uh, where or the root cause of where those, this infant mortality is coming from. Last but not least, another uh, information we can extract from uh, from the, uh, those numbers given here in the table. If we look at the scale parameter uh, eta, uh, as shown here encircled in red, uh, we can uh, have the um, the time between when we move from infant mortality or to uh, wear out. So the cutoff time between infant mortality and wear out, and it's 135 days. So before 135 days, we are in infant mortality stage. And after infant mort uh, 135 days, sorry, we would move into um, the wear out phase. So this is the type of information we can extract uh, typically from a bathtub curve. I'd like to move on to some concluding remarks. So um, I hope you've learned something from this presentation and we have seen how a bathtub curve is built and uh, how we can extract different types of information from it. Uh, in summary, a uh, theoretical bathtub is essentially three failure rate curves combining uh, three weighable distributions. We can have three sections, infant mortality, random, and aging. 
Uh, infant mortality is undesirable but can be tackled using RCAs. Random failures are also undesirable uh, and difficult to manage. The aging failure section is easier to manage over the long term. We can quantify the proportion of each section in order to evaluate if any action is needed. So we can use this concept to implement continuous improvement strategies, example RCAs, and optimize our financial spend. The big picture of the bathtub curve informs us on how an asset will behave uh, over their lifetime. So thank you very much for your attention and thanks again for, uh, to the LRVS for having me. Before I take any questions, I just wanted to point out that I wrote a short article on the bathtub curve and it's on my web website listed below um, and, um, and it covers the questions we discussed today. So thank you very much. Uh, uh, any questions, uh, I'll be happy to answer. Oh, that was a great that was a great presentation. So now we would like to open up the floor for anyone to have any questions. Get a lot of thank yous and a lot of very good information text I right guess now. It's clear as mud, right? <laughs> now I think this is a very, very good presentation. Um so when speaking on, let's say, a lubrication plan, right, or somewhere where, you know, lubricants are heavily used, um, since you don't really like preventative maintenance and RCAs are the way to go, what is something that you have typically experienced in the field that uh, could cause infant mortality? Yeah, it's like probably bad lubrication or inappropriate uh, um, poor maintenance practices, you know, over lubricating. Um, so if if your technicians, it's no fault of them, but if not, they're not trained properly, um, you know, they don't know what they're doing. Um, they, they don't know what the frequency or the quality, or it, it was mentioned earlier about contamination, and all this, and it can cause infant mortality. Infant mortality is, early failures or failures which happen too early for our you know uh, for, for us to be satisfied right so the, the and, and that's where that's how I would say the organization has to investigate why those are happening and and address them it could be addressed through training it could be addressed to better lubrication products um also how you handle your uh, lubricants, right? Yes, yes. Okay, and one more question for me. So you you know a lot about this subject. You you're you're an expert in it. Um, if you had say you you were lucky, you're in a plant, you found a, a a genie in the plant. You can make one wish that everyone could effectively you know do one thing to make everything more reliable. What would that be? Oh, I think it's collaboration. Um, it's uh, it's collaboration, and uh, everybody has a function in the organization. Everybody has an expertise. So, um, bringing all those expertise together uh, to get find the best solution. So, for example, reliability engineers like me, we are out of a job if the people who in the field. Um, um, they, they, they don't give us the information so we can do our work, work right. And likewise, we help people in the field uh, um, um, find better solutions to their problems. So it's a lot of collaboration. It's a lot of valuing each other's skill sets. And uh, if those skill sets are insufficient, like I mentioned training earlier, identifying those needs and then training people so they can perform at their best. Okay, understood, understood. Now, before we close, is there anything that you would like to tell everyone out there? Yeah, well, so if you, if anybody has any questions, uh, I'm not a reliability, uh, sorry, I'm not a lubrication expert, but uh, 
I have done lots of work with uh, lubrication people. If you have any questions on the presentation, please uh, please send me those questions and I'm happy, I'll be happy to uh, inform you or answer your questions and maybe help, help you get better at your job whilst learning myself. Thank you very much. That's great, that's great. Well, um, thank you for taking the time to speaking here at LRBS Americas 2023. And everyone, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to Andre. He knows what he's talking about. And I look forward to seeing you all in the next session. Thank you. Have a great session, everyone.